All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May California and Southwest Drought Update and Wild, Wildfire Outlook webinar. This webinar is a special joint regional, regional webinar combining the California Nevada Early Warning System webinar series, which is co-hosted by NIDIS and CNAP, a NOAA RESA team, and the Southwest Drought Briefings, which are produced by the Intermountain West Drought Early Warning System and the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. This webinar series is designed to provide the region with timely information on current drought status and associated impacts, as well as a preview of upcoming climatic events. Thank you that have joined us previously and those that may be joining us for the first time. Uh, my name is Amanda Sheffield and I'm a regional drought information coordinator for NIDIS um, covering California and Nevada. And I'm joined today by Joel Lisenby, who's the Intermountain West Juice Coordinator, and Emily Elias, who's the director of the Southwest Climate Hub um, in moderating and sharing information today. Before we get started, I just want to note for everyone that this webinar is being recorded and the recording and a brief summary, summary will be available on drought.gov and our YouTube channel um, later this week. We've got a great set of speakers here today covering drought, climate, and the wildland fire outlooks, and then also post-fire recovery and resources. Um, speakers will be more fully introduced later, but I've included some of their in initial information in the chat box on the side, as well as a Southwest Drought Status Update handout. Um, Uh, before we get started, I guess I'll just tell you a little bit about NIDIS for those that may not have, may not be as familiar with us yet. Um, NIDIS's mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactive manage drought-related risk. We provide those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. Um, we fulfill this mandate by building a national drought early warning system, or what we call DUES, um, through advancing regional drought early warning systems, um, such as the webinar today that will cover those for California, Nevada, and the Intermountain West. Uh, activities cover improving drought prediction and forecasting, supporting drought planning and preparedness, strengthening collaboration, supporting drought impact assessment, and leading the U.S. drought portal, which is drought.gov. What is the Regional Drought Early Warning System? Um, it's a network that utilizes new and existing partner networks to optimize the information we can give about drought, trying to make the best climate and drought science and impact data readily available, easily understandable and usable for decision makers. Um, our hope is to help folks better monitor, forecast, plan for, and cope with the impacts of drought. And just a quick, um, if those of you who don't know, we did launch a completely redesigned drought.gov back in January, which is a lot of tools and resources that'll be covered here on the webinar, but also a lot more other information, including interactive maps and data, new by sector information, research and learn information. And we really improved our usability and accessibility of information. Um, and we hope that's a great resource for you guys out there, especially during the current conditions. Uh, with that, I'd like to take a moment to pass over to our partner, Emily Elias, for a special acknowledgement. Thanks, Amanda. Hi, everyone. We begin this webinar by acknowledging that the land each of us is joining from today is the ancestral land of indigenous cultures. As we are all in different parts of this country, this will be different for all of us. The land where I'm speaking from is the ancestral lands and territories of the Ute, Apache, the Pueblos, Hopi, Zuni, and the Diné Nation. We believe it's important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of this land and region have long been told from one dominant perspective without full acknowledgement of the people who lived on this land before us. It's also important because many of us are land managers or work in support of land managers and we strive to manage the land well for future generations and for the good of all. Thank you for your attention in acknowledging this important history. Great, thank you, Emily. And then with that, we're ready to kick off our great speakers that we have today. Um, how today will work is we're first gonna have two presentations. Uh, one from Brian Fuchs, who's a climatologist with the National Drought Mitigation Center. He will be providing the drought and climate update and outlook, followed by the wild, wildfire potential outlook from Chuck Maxwell, who's a, the predictive services manager with the Southwest Coordination Center. After those first two talks, we'll have question and answer period, followed by two other talks that I'll introduce after that at that time. Uh, if you do have a question during any of the talks, please enter them into the questions box on your GoTo, uh, GoTo webinar control panel. And with that, I think we're ready to kick things off to Brian. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think you need to give me control, Amanda, so I can, there we go. So I'm gonna share my screen here and you should all be seeing my PowerPoint that starts off with current conditions and outlook. Uh, again, my name is uh, Brian Fuchs. I am a climatologist by training uh, and also lead the monitoring area at the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Also one of the U.S. Drought Monitor authors. Uh, and, and today what I'm going to do, and again, uh, with this uh, talk, uh, uh, don't, don't kill the messenger because uh, there's going to be a lot of good information shared, but for the most part, for the region as a whole, a lot of this information isn't going to be uh, uh, too, too, too good. I guess we're, we're going to be going down a path that uh, the drought that we're experiencing is definitely uh, not going to be uh, going away anytime soon, and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So uh, with that word of warning, I'm going to take off and, and go through uh, my slides here. So the first slide here is the current drought monitor map. So this came out last Thursday morning. And you know, if, if you took a line and divided the country from east to west in the plains, you, you'd really get a, a idea of you know, where drought is taking place and where drought is, is really a non-issue. And the southwest definitely has stood out. This has been an area where uh, we've seen drought now for uh, the past couple of years, and, and not only just drought, but quite uh, severe drought at that. So you, you see all the browns and, and dark reds in from California to Nevada to the Four Corners region, and we are seeing a great deal of extreme and exceptional drought. And this has been integrated into the landscape now for, for over a year now in, in many of these locations. And, and so again, the impacts are really starting to, to uh, build on us. So when we zoom into the west, again, those areas of the southwest especially really stand out. But some of the numbers in, in the statistical table to the right-hand side of the image, they, they kind of tell a story too. So last May, the region as a whole, we only had right, right at 39% of the region in any level of drought. And that currently is a little over 83%. So we've more than doubled the amount of drought in the western U.S. just in the last year. But the one that really stands out to me is when we start looking at the amount of D3 and D4 drought. Last year at this time, right at 3% of the region had D3 or D4 drought, and now we're over 46% of the region. So almost half of the West, which is a very large area, we're seeing extreme to exceptional drought taking place. And when we zoom into the, the Southwest region as a whole, the one thing that stands out Again, just look at how much of that D4 brown that's on the map. I mean, we're, we're right at 38% of the Southwest region. Last year at this time, we this area had none. So again, D4 drought went from zero a year ago to uh, 37 and a half, 37.655% this year. And that continues to grow. It's not like we have seen the intensification stop. Uh, as we go into uh, the last part of spring and early summer, we are, we're continuing to see the, this grow. And even if you go back to the water year, back in uh, the beginning of October, again, these numbers really do stand out. The Southwest right now, a little over 92% of the region in some level of drought compared to 48, 49% of the region a year ago. So we've almost doubled again, the amount of drought in just the Southwest region and we really have shown that that drought has intensified to the point where most of it is exceptional drought now in the region. And when we start looking at the, the time series of the drought monitor, again, the drought monitor only goes back to 2000, but it does give a good perspective of, of what we've seen over the last couple of decades. And we, we have a couple periods of drought that really stood out. So the early 2000s that I circled, uh, 2002 to about 2005, we saw a lot of extreme drought uh, in the region. And then we had some pockets of time where, yes, there was some drought, but it, the intensification didn't seem to be as, as long-term or, or as broad. And then we got to the, the early uh, 20, 2011, 2012 era, and that went all the way to about 2017. We had about a five-year period where drought really covered the, west, the southwestern landscape again, and we did see a little bit more D3 and D4. 
And then on the far right of this time series, it really stands out with just how rapidly this drought came up and, and started impacting the region. We're just under 80% at D3, but you can also see that we haven't had D3 uh, covering this portion of the Southwest hardly at all over this time frame. So pretty important to note that. And as we zoom into California, we can see that again, 100% uh, of the state is in drought. A year ago, we were just at 46, almost 47%. 73% of the state is in D3 or worse drought. Last year at this time, it was just under 3%. And you can see the map from May 19th of 2020. Most of that was in uh, far Northern California at that time where much of the uh, Southern third of the state we didn't even have any depiction on the drought monitor map. It was pretty much uh, uh, doing okay at that point in time. So again, just how rapidly we, we've seen this drought develop and intensify. Going into the outlooks, what I'm gonna do is go through the short-term outlooks and then go into the seasonal at the end and finish up with the, the seasonal drought outlook as well. So over the next six to 10 days, looking at the, the Western US and the Southwestern US, temperatures are in a couple areas uh, better than our above normal probabilities of above normal temperatures but also on the right hand side you see that dry signal that much of the western u.s especially uh, in the pacific northwest is seeing above normal chances of below normal precipitation as we go out 8 to 14 we kind of see that heat signal settle into more of the western u.s especially in the pacific northwest with the uh, much of the region with above normal chances of above normal temperatures. And again, that dry signal stays in place uh, through much of the uh, Western US as well. As we look at the month of June, and this has been pretty uh, steady over time through many of the runs that uh, the, these uh, products come out from the Climate Prediction Center, uh, the Western US is showing an above normal uh, chances of above normal temperatures through much of the region. Uh, and again, this is starting to center on the, the, the Southwest as a whole. And during that time, uh, we do see some equal chances for precipitation in the region, but we also see that uh, there's, there's been a pretty strong signal of below normal uh, precipitation chances through a lot of the West during this time as well. As we look at the summer as a whole, so this is the months of uh, June, July, and August. Again, the desert Southwest really stands out with that heat signature. And if you recall a year ago, what really brought this drought into its own realm was just how hot it was in the summer months through the desert Southwest with many all time records being set at the state level and local levels. And again, when we start thinking about the heat last summer in the region and seeing a very similar signal to this summer, that doesn't bode well. Again, a, a lot of uh, uh, this drought that's already causing problems and near peak intensification is gonna continue to get worse. And then you go to the right-hand side of this slide where we see the equal chances over uh, some of California, Nevada, and Arizona, but a lot of the West is still being uh, hampered with that signal of uh, above normal chances of below normal precipitation through the summer months. And again, July and August, we'd really like to see that monsoon signal kick in in the Southwest. So that's yet to be determined really. And when we look at the seasonal drought outlook going forward, the areas in brown is where drought is gonna persist, could even intensify. The areas in yellow are where we do not currently have drought, but we're likely going to see drought develop. And what we don't see a lot of on this map outside of Texas and Oklahoma are areas where drought removal is likely or drought would persist but maybe improve. Again, that western half of the US, you draw that line through the plains and if you're on the west side of that line, you're gonna be talking about drought going into the future. This takes us all the way through the end of August. It came, this product came out last week. So again, we're gonna be watching these drought outlooks uh, going forward. And again, a key for the Southwest is really gonna be what that monsoon does this summer, as well as what those temperatures are gonna do this summer. If we see that, that strong heat signal come to fruition and the monsoon doesn't play out like it has uh, the last couple of years where the monsoon has been kind of disappointing. Uh, some of these areas of the Southwest are gonna continue to see the impact to drought really uh, increase. That's all I have. Uh, my contact information is up here, btux2 at unl.edu. 
and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thanks, Brian. And then next up is Chuck Maxwell, who's from the Southwest Coordination Center. And Chuck Maxwell is getting himself ready. Stand by, please. Let's see. Okay, one more thing. I think I'll be there. Thank you, Brian, for setting me up so nicely. Okay, am I in full screen mode now, somebody? Yes, you're great. Go. Excellent. Thank you so very much for that introduction. So Brian stole a lot of my thunder and a lot of red and browns out of the products I was going to show, which is awesome. So I don't have to go over them so much as more. Uh, my name is Chuck Maxwell. I'm a meteorologist with the uh, Southwest Coordination Center down here in Albuquerque, working with Predictive Services. I'm speaking today on behalf for a national program, standing in for Nick Nostler, who works up at uh, Nick, Nick at Nick. A um, little bit of a disappointment I'm going to tell you right now is that we're in the process of updating our outlooks right now. Our, our updated outlook comes out next week, so I'm going to be showing you the last outlook with a little bit of a interpretation in there. So um, just putting that out there straight away. So just a real quick overview of what we do is to understand the context. Um, basically, we are in the we're really in the big picture here of moving basically fire management resources around the country, supporting the national coordination system which moves teams, crews, air tankers, and whatnot across the country and between the geographic area coordination centers. Really, we're all about large scale, long term. Where are we going to have big fires with teams on them? Where's the, the resources and the fire activity? So it's not just about weather and climate. It's about managing the firefighting resources across the entire country. And we, pr we provide a variety of uh, products and information to help do that, including our seasonal outlooks. And a key point here is that uh, each one of these colored areas, geographic areas, um, we do our own kind of outlooks independently with some similar processes, and we kind of marry them back up to produce what you're gonna be seeing here. Um, so again, one of the big products we do, I'm showing you today is our National Significant Fire Potential Outlook. Uh, we do it every month, and we're basically forecasting out four months ahead. And this is kind of important because we're trying to forecast above or below normal significant fire potential, which has a specific meaning. Um, so I'll tell you that in a second, but we do combine a bunch of, of different information, trying to look at the whole fire environment, weather and climate and so forth. Again, trying to find out in the big picture logistically where we're gonna be needing firefighting resources from the greater system and where we might not. So what, just real quick on this image here, if you saw the little miniature um, shapes in the background, those are our zones or predictive services areas. Important to know that every single one of these has like a significant fire size or threshold that, that, that constitutes significant fire activity. What all these outlooks are doing is telling month by month, is, it, is there a greater chance that's gonna happen or a lesser chance? So what you might not see or know in the background is there is a normal behind that, which I'll be speaking to here shortly makes it a little complicated sometimes to interpret. A little bit more about how the sausage is made in terms of our outlooks. Um, it's a lot of complex information, kind of like drought, you're looking at a, a basically a compilation of information over the past several years and seasons. So looking at the current conditions, how they get there, um, we're looking at fuels, uh, soil, snowpack, things like that, fuel loading. Um, in terms of things like, the, like grasses, we need to have moisture and rainfall to get grasses to grow. Um, so that's important. Uh, of course, the timing of the fire season, is it late, is it early, is it prolonged? And look, working with weather and climate, of course we work with the Climate Prediction Center and in-house we try and do some work to figure out what the patterns are, the, the modalities within that. Uh, we're focusing on things like El Nino, Southern Oscillation, other global signals. And again, just looking for the big picture signals, kind of like Brian just spoke to with the drought, looking out through the summer, blending together to anticipate where and when things happen. Of course, this becomes pretty dynamic complex uh, and complex as we have some pretty big offsetting factors and also this normal thing is a moving target, which I'll show you here in a moment. So one of the key things I figure since this is a drought conference, um, as we talk about drought in fire, in fire potential and fire outlooks, it's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, you might think you would have an area that was just all maroon or dark brown or whatever, the some severe drought and the whole place is gonna burn up. But the reality is drought really does increase fire danger and potential in our forested areas and places where there's brush, it certainly in fact, uh, impacts surface water availability to fight fires. At the same time though, it can limit or prevent the growth of grasses. So if you're in a place like the Great Basin of the Southwest where 50% or more of all the fires happen in grass, 
and it doesn't rain for two years, you have some offsetting impacts, right? So you don't have as much grass to burn, but maybe your, your, your forests are tinder dry. So that does complicate these outlooks in years like this where drought is so widespread and so pretty severe, basically. In terms of normal, because that's something we're gonna be talking about is there is a progression. It's, if you follow these uh, images here kind of clockwise from May, June, July, August, um, in the western half of this, the U.S., fire tends to kind of works with the southwest monsoon, starts up in the southwest in May or June, and tends to kind of rotate clockwise into California, across the Great Basin and four corner states, and towards the northwest. There's a typical progression there, which just happens. So if this is going to happen in a way that's earlier or much more severe than usual, that would tend to show up on our outlooks as something that were just vanilla. It, it is normal that we have fire activity. We're not going to be predicting that, you know, this is normal stuff here. So that's the key is we're, we're trying to predict when it's going to be above and beyond what our system is used to dealing with. So into some data, and I won't go too much in this because Brian did a great job, but um, past couple of years, if you look at 2020, the lead up to last year, what's uh, interesting is we had a lot of moisture in the Southwest, really least the Southern parts of it, where places like California, Nevada, Utah stayed uniformly dry. So drought building, as was already depicted. If you check out some of the precipitation ranks over the past year or 18 months, um, boy, the top driest past year in most of the states, for either first or second for all the states encompassed within this discussion today. That is pretty substantial, can't ignore that. Um, maybe not quite as bad in the past 18 months, but the bottom line is it's dry. It's dry and we're in drought and it's been bad, historically bad. Taking a look at something like snowpack, of course, if we have snowpack on the ground, we're not gonna have that many fires in those areas. Um, snowpack tends to wane this time of year anyway. This is from early in May. But in any event, anytime you're seeing numbers down in the single digits relative to normal, that's not a good thing. Um, you want your snowpack to stay on as long in the spring and be, have as much snow water equivalent in it as possible. And we're just not seeing that uniformly across most of the Southwest region. It's just not looking good. So season would start early, snow melt off would be early, um, water supplies down. I guess I won't speak too much to this because mine are outdated and the bottom line is the drought is here and the forecast is for it to stay and or worsen across the entire area. Same with the temperature and precipitation. Uh, one thing I will say about this is that the above normal uh, bullseye over the Southwest has become kind of, I guess I'll say typical in the climate change uh, era. Um, so I'm not sure what to make of that in terms of a pattern. I definitely would rather see green in terms of precipitation than brown or equal chances, but I'm not sure this is entirely a terrible signal here for all the Southwest. I, I see some potential at least for some moisture in the summertime in the South in Arizona and New Mexico we didn't have last year. So we'll see, it looks again pretty bad. It's not breaking drought. Um, perhaps conditions will improve with the months soon there later in the summer, a lot of ifs. And one thing I like to check before I go out and provide the outlook is what's just happened in the past month. Because although we've been in a drought and it's been relatively warm and dry, we did get a spell here in the four corner states anyway of relatively moist and cool conditions that really did kind of take the edge off of fire danger and so forth in the eastern halves of, uh, of Colorado and New Mexico. So not, not uh, breaking the spell for the whole area by any chance, um, but at least good to see some areas of coolness and moisture. And uh, noting California is staying dark red on both counts. So I'll kind of walk you through again for the next four months what we'd issued the last time. And again, we're looking for the, the potential here for large fire activity for the most part to be greater than normal. So this isn't just day-to-day -day fire activity. It's when are we gonna put out teams, crews, resources. So we had forecast for May, the entire Southwest, uh, pardon, pardon me, my Southwest, Arizona and New Mexico and parts of West Texas to be above normal. That ended up not working out across northern portions of the region here because of that recent trend I just showed you. But the big picture trend is that as we go through from May to June to July and August, the entire situation there in terms of above normal potential just kind of rotates counterclockwise out of the Southwest up into and across California and the Great Basin states. Um, as I'm looking at this now for August and July and talking about the recent updates we were gonna make last week, I can see there being more red and longer in the Southwest this summer with the monsoon coming into question. Um, I think it's probably gonna be somewhat similar to where it is up in here, but we're gonna be seeing that above normal potential spread up across this entire area probably through the summer, including eventually even Montana and the Northwestern states as we get later in the summer. So again, that's the basic gist right there. It kind of just follows our, our basic seasonal progression, just says it's gonna be really bad. 
Yeah, I think that's, that it is. Uh, perhaps not as bad as last year. We do have some hope for the monsoon this year. We, we're not real clear. The signals are a bit muddled, but it does look like we at least might have one. Uh, last year was, I think, the driest monsoon on record that we had down this area, and that did not bode well for fire activity. So summary, basically above normal significant fire potential for much of the southwest area down here uh, through June, and we expect the southwest monsoon should, monsoon should start to positively infect us, affect us in July and into August. We're not real clear if it's going to totally end the fire season like we want it to, uh, but we hope it'll be beneficial like it was not last year. Um, the above normal potential also shifts west and north through the summer, the Great Basin Rocky Mountain areas, and pretty much the mountains and foothills, especially at California, are expected to increase to above normal through the entire time period from June through August and probably stay there through the fall. So again, this we're going to be updating this official outlook with, uh, with more colors, probably more red, next week. So please check back with us then. There's a link there to get to that. And here is my contact information, and I will pass it back to questions. My contact information, Chuck Maxwell, is at the very bottom. So I went through that kind of quickly. Thank you so much for having me here. Glad to take any questions. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Brian. This is Joel Lisenby from NIDAS. I'm going to be fielding some of the questions. Uh, we have about eight minutes for questions before the next set of presenters. So I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but if you've asked a question that we don't get to, then we will, I'll capture these and we'll send some email to follow up. The first few are going to be for Brian. Um, Anna asks, Brian, how are the different, uh, drought, the different tiers of drought defined? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so each of the different tiers of drought are defined by a ranking percentile methodology. So when we have D0 drought, that's saying that the majority of the indicators are falling in the lowest 30th percentile. When you get to D1, it's uh, the 21st to 30th. D2 is, is uh, uh, 10 to 20, D3 is third to fifth, and D4 is the first or second percentile, meaning that uh, you would only see those type of drought conditions once or twice in 100 years of data. And again, it's the majority of the indicators. We're not picking the best or the worst uh, indicators. We're looking at where the majority of those indicators are pointing. And so each one of the several dozen pieces of data that the drought monitor authors go through uh, are ranked in that percentile and all of them correspond to that D0 through D4 uh, intensity level. If you want Great. more information on that, uh, shoot me an email. I'd be glad to uh, provide a more thorough explanation on an email. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, we have a, a couple of questions that came in about the monsoon. So I'll open this up to both of you. What Both of you mentioned that we don't really know much about the, what the monsoon is going to do. What do we know? about the monsoon. Do we know anything yet? Uh, Brian? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I, I, I can start with that it didn't happen last year. Like I could say that last year was the first in 22 years that I've ever seen where it rained only for two weeks and then it stopped. And the impact on fire activity here was astronaut. So that's where I'm starting is last year is a classic case of a non-soon. Take it away, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> To build on that, Chuck, I think uh, even where it did rain was pretty isolated to more of uh, uh, portions of southern Colorado and eastern, eastern New Mexico. There were some showers in other places, but the, the consistent rain was really offset to one particular part of the southwest. Uh, you know, every summer in mid-July, we start seeing the increase of humidity, the change of the wind flows in, into the southwest region. And it really is hit and miss on where those showers develop, how long they last for, and how much precipitation overall during that uh, uh, three to four, five, six week season uh, the region gets. So like Chuck said, last year we really missed out on it. And I think the heat had a lot to do with it where the atmosphere, even though it had the additional moisture, it just was not able to uh, uh, destabilize due to that heat cap that was over the region. Uh, I haven't studied it enough to, uh, to, to give an exact scientific explanation, but that's my, my guess. And so going into this year, we really don't know, Joel. It, it is a tough question to ask because it could start early, it could start late, it could last a long period of time, it could last a couple weeks. It's really a, 
uh, the coin flip as to what, what we're going to see in the region. Great. Thanks for that. And the, the question, one of the questions was specifically about the, the forecast. And I think you mentioned that. Um, I think I, both of you showed the seasonal outlooks for rainfall and the, the white area, um, I, I think I just would like to highlight that that means that there's an equal chance of being above or below the normal rainfall. It doesn't necessarily mean average. So there's really not a lot coming from those forecasts. So thanks uh, to both of you for explaining that. Um, we've had a question. Carl asks about where the snowpack information comes from, and I think that was directed at Chuck. You showed some snowpack information. Where are you getting the data? I believe it's from the NASH, the from NRCC. Yeah, that, that's, I'll I'll build on that, Chuck, if you want. Please, yes. Um, the the snowfall data is coming from the upper elevation snow tail sites, which is coming out of the NRCS. Uh, Water and Climate Center in Portland, Oregon, they kind of oversee the entire network. And so these are high elevation snow pillows, if you would call them, that not only measure uh, the depth of the snow, but the moisture in the snow. And most of those have soil moisture sensors on them as well. And they are all at uh, higher elevations. Okay, thanks for that. Um, this is a question for Brian Thomas asks, would you have any data available, any data available on evaporation rates from soils? Now this question came in when you were talking about the seasonal outlook. So I'm, I think that that's the context of, of the question about, do we, ha do we have any information about uh, forecast evaporation rates or soil moisture? Well, in a forecast setting, no, because a lot of that would be directly correlated to temperatures. And so even on an observing type of platform, a lot of that comes through either model data or models that are driven by uh, satellite information. Uh, we do have some on the ground sites that do measure uh, evapotranspiration, evaporation, and even soil moisture levels, but they're far and few between. There's not a lot of data points that are actually doing that. And so we do rely a lot on model information that are, again, one of the driving factors for that is going to be temperatures. Okay, thanks. One, one more question about the seasonal outlook and then we'll move on to the next presenters. Um, we know that in a lot of the Western United States, summer is very dry. They, there are parts of the desert that don't even get a monsoon. We're looking at parts of maybe um, uh, Southern Utah and, and Nevada and parts of California. With that in mind, Meredith asks, when you have an area where normal for summer is no precipitation or almost none, then how does near normal or more than normal or less than normal, how does that get interpreted? And would we ever expect more than normal if the normal is very close to zero anyway? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And you're right, in an arid or semi-arid environment, it does become a little bit more tricky uh, and that's why you, when we start looking at these drought situations, we look at multiple time scales. Uh, you're right, uh, one rain event in a desert region could push that area to well above normal precipitation for uh, not only a one month period, but even for an entire summer period. So those, those uh, uh, values can change quite rapidly due to maybe just a handful of events. And so when you start looking at uh, multiple time scales, instead of just focusing on maybe the summer or the last six months, we start looking at everything from the last month all the way out to the last year, year and a half, to just kind of to get a bigger picture of that water balance over time for that region, where we can see that it, okay, it's been hot and dry now for 12 of the last 15 months. Uh, we do know that a single, uh, good summer rain event isn't going to change that. It's going to take more than that. And it's okay if I add to that real quick? Yeah, go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, just in terms of the fire potential forecast part of that, I would look to the fuels. So interesting question. So you can have um, normal, right, like in a desert, normal temperature and precipitation, which be maybe nothing. But if you have a lot of carryover fine fuels from a wet year last year, your fire potential is above normal. So a lot of what we're doing is kind of like what Brian just said, we're looking at how the fuels are reacting over the past months and years. A lot of those are desert grasses and rangeland grasses. So we're looking at how stuff's carrying over year to year to see how the current weather and climate works with that. That's fascinating. Thanks for explaining that. Um, thanks both Brian and Chuck. 
Uh, we're going to move on to the next presenters, uh, but stick around if you can. Questions that we, if we have time, we might come back to. Uh, but that I'm going to hand over back to Amanda to introduce the uh, the next speakers. Great, uh, thanks, Joel. Um, as Joel mentioned, we're on to our next two, pre two presenters, and then we'll do more question and answers after that. Our next presentation is how do drought and vegetation recovery influence post wild post wildfire hazards. This is by Luke McGuire, who is a, an assistant professor in geosciences at the University of Arizona. And Luke, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, sorry, just took a second for the uh, share screen button to pop up, but should be good to go here in a second. Um, so yeah, thank you, Amanda, um, for the introduction. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit uh, from talking about fire to some of what we can expect after fires occur. And um, in particular, I'm going to be talking about post-fire debris flow hazards. Um, while I do that, it's always helpful to have a picture in your mind of what exactly a debris flow is. And I want you to picture something that looks like um, this, this thing over here in the upper right something that's got the consistency of flowing concrete. It's very viscous because it's a flow that consists of a mixture of sediment and water and large boulders. Oftentimes these boulders move up towards the front of the flow and form a really large bouldery front. Uh, that increases the um, destructive potential of these flows relative to things you may be more familiar with like flash floods that just have less sediment in them. And so what I hope to do is just um, talk a little bit about the areas that are susceptible to post-fire debris flows and then get into how drought and vegetation recovery might influence that this particular hazard. And as a some quick motivation, this is something that you all may be familiar with from what's been covered in the media over the last several years. There have been a couple of impactful events one of them was in Montecito, California, a community near Santa Barbara. And this photo is showing some of the, um, the aftermath of a post-fire debris flow event that followed the, the Thomas fire in early 2018. You can see a lot of mud and debris here, um, partially inundating a number of houses in this image. And one reason why um, these events occur more frequently downstream of burned areas relative to unburned areas is that fire has a couple of key impacts, not only on the vegetation, but also on the soil that tend to facilitate the formation of these destructive flows. And one, one thing that I want to point out is that you can think of the vegetation in this context almost as being like a sponge, that it, it helps to store some of the rainfall that occurs so that not all of that water makes it down to the soil surface to run off and have the potential to, um, to erode sediment and, and generate these flows. And then secondly, in unburned areas, this vegetation also produces a, a lot of uh, leaves and twigs uh, that we might call litter that, that covers the, the uh, soil surface, protecting it from um, erosion from raindrop impact but also slowing down overland flow and runoff and making it follow a more tortuous path down, down through the channel network so that you just de you don't get flows concentrating as rapidly as you would in a burned area where you don't have that rough surface to just help slow things down. And then lastly, fires have a pretty can have a profound effect on a soil's ability to infiltrate water. This is one example here on the right. I'm going to show a video of me pouring some water out of a water bottle uh, onto a, a recently burned soil. And you'll notice that the water doesn't infiltrate. It just forms this blob here that kind of moves back and forth as the, as the wind blows it, but it doesn't infiltrate. And so it's this fire-induced water repellency that can also have a large impact on generating post-fire flows. One thing that we've found from our studies is that post-fire debris flows tend to initiate once some critical rainfall intensity duration threshold has been exceeded. And what I mean by that is that um, there's a particular intensity of rainfall that if it's maintained for a given duration, usually produces a debris flow. For example, in Southern California, um, we can look at these yellow circles here. 
And the way to interpret this graph is that if we have an average rainfall intensity of greater than about 15 millimeters an hour for more than a duration of 15 minutes, then we're going to fall above this yellow curve and we're likely to see a debris flow. Whereas if we have a rainstorm that produces a peak intensity that's less than this value, we're unlikely to have a debris flow. So we can develop these curves for different parts of the United States and previous studies have done that. And you can see the wide uh, variation that we have here and the intensity and duration of rainfall that it takes to generate these types of flows. And so we have developed models to be able to predict the types of rainstorms that produce these flows. And they depend on, on the terrain properties, how steep a landscape is, the erodibility of the soil, and the severity of the fire. The US Geological Survey publishes um, post-fire debris flow hazard assessments that, um, that can be used to determine, like I say, the, the storms that might produce these impactful flows. Um, but what's less known is, is what happens as a landscape recovers. If we're not talking about the immediate aftermath of a fire anymore, we're looking beyond just one year, then how does a drought following a fire affect um, how much rainfall it takes to generate these hazards? And how does that relate to vegetation recovery? So these are some of the questions that we're starting to ask. And um, that's, that's what I'd, I'd like to, to try to talk about here in the last few minutes. Um, so you can see that one of the, one of the um, most notable effects after a year or two of recovery, if I toggle back and forth between these images, is that the landscape starts to green up again and you get the, you know, the return of a, of a canopy of vegetation to be the, act as that sort of sponge you get a much rougher surface here. Um, and all of these things contribute to having a, a lower potential for debris flows. So when we go to these sites and we make measurements and we track vegetation recovery over time, we find that, um, that changes to vegetation and soil do have a noticeable impact on how intense the rainfall needs to be before we would produce a debris flow. On the right-hand side, this is a model result based on our field observations and measurements. And what you see here from this burned area in Southern California is that in the first year after a fire, we would predict that we could get these, um, these flows with a peak rainfall intensity of about 10 millimeters per hour. And you get that type of rainstorm with, with less than a one year recurrence interval. But after two to three years of recovery, as that vegetation comes back, it may take rain, rainstorms that have peak intensities that are six to seven times greater than that and those storms may only occur um, with a recurrence interval of five to 10 years. So they're much less likely to happen. And our modeling suggests that this is mainly due to things associated with vegetation recovery, with the roughness of the surface, with the ability of the canopy to intercept rainfall. So anything that would delay that vegetation recovery, like a drought, could have an impact on how long that debris flow hazard persists. I will say that this isn't something that's, that's there's not a single answer throughout the Western US when we look at other sites, here's an example from Western New Mexico, we again see an increase in rainfall intensity is required to generate debris flows as the landscape recovers. But here, the main story is about the return of somewhat normal infiltration rates in the soil. It's not so much about vegetation recovery. So the story isn't consistent from spot to spot. One last thing about um, debris flow hazards returning to Southern California is that we can also see shallow landslides. It's a slightly different um, way to generate a debris flow rather than surface water runoff that, that rapidly entrains a lot of uh, sediment. But we do see shallow landslides as the system starts to recover. And one thing that we've noticed from our study sites um, in the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles is that we tend to see shallow landslides in recovering burned areas that are on south facing slopes where vegetation appears to be recovering more slowly and um, so again, just to point out the importance of anything that's going to delay vegetation recovery, whether it's drought or whether it's um, uh, hill slope aspect or um, uh, anything like that is potentially important for determining when and where we might see these types of hazards. So in summary, debris flow susceptibility after fire changes with time as soils and vegetation recovery uh, recover and the timing and spatial variations in vegetation recovery can be uh, sufficiently large to influence hazard potential. So thank you, and you can see some more details about this project um, from uh, this website uh, that you can get to through drought.gov.
Great. Thank you, Luke. And then our last presenter before questions uh, is Emily Elias. She is the director of the Southwest Climate Hub, and she will be presenting on post wildfire resources. Thanks, Amanda. Can you see my presentation? Oh, we see your email right now. Sorry. Oh, that's unfortunate. Let's see if I can get to the right one. How about now? Now you're good. Great. Excellent. Sorry about that. Um, so Amanda and Joel and I, as we were talking about this webinar, decided that it would be really good to end the presentations that Brian and Chuck and Luke gave with some post wildfire resources. So we're going to take the last five minutes of this webinar to highlight some resources. I am, as Amanda mentioned, the director of the Southwest Climate Hub. There are 10 climate hubs across the nation. And we work in three functional areas. And so I've organized this presentation around those functional areas, tool development and technology transfer. And so I'll be talking about three tools that might be relevant to people listening today. We also convene scientists and stakeholders. And so I'll be presenting um, an adaptation process and some menus that relate to wildfire. And then finally, I'll be presenting um, what we often do is literature review and science synthesis. And so I'll show a few more recent literature reviews and science syntheses. So the first tool I wanna to mention really relates to what Luke just presented about debris, debris flows and, and what happens um, during drought and after fire. And so this tool was developed by Megan Friggins with the US Forest Service along with the Southwest Climate Hub. It's called After Fire. It's a toolkit for the Southwest and Joel will be dropping the links to some of these tools into the chat box so that you'll be able to look at them yourselves. But the intent of this tool was to provide guidance for assessing and preventing potential damage due to post-fire flooding and related events similar to what Luke just presented. This is a screen capture of the tool. So you can see it provides broad information around post-fire flood events and water quality and erosion. But then it gets into resources by different manager type, tools specific to a group going to assess the damage or what the potential flooding may be. And then I think really important for communities is funding. And this tool covers New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. So if a community is looking for funding to try to mitigate some of these post-fire challenges, this is a great place to go. The next tool I want to mention was developed out of the California Climate Hub. It's called a ClimateWise Restoration Toolkit. And um, because it was from the California Hub, it focuses on just one location. And what you can see here is that the users defined past fires, they define the cumulative water deficit and other management interests. And then the output shows areas for reforestation consideration based on priority. So priorities across the landscape. And these are presented by forest community type. So it helps prioritize what forest community you might want to think about when you're thinking about post-fire restoration. The third tool I want to mention is the post-fire spatial conifer restoration planning tool. And this tool, as the name implies, focuses on conifers and the user would have to upload a few pieces of data or information to decide where natural regeneration might occur and then conversely where you might want to um, help it along. So those are three tools that may be helpful. The adaptation process is a different way of going about things, but something the climate hubs do quite a lot. Um, the climate change response framework is one that we follow where we define a project area, assess some um, specific climate change impacts and vulnerabilities, and then evaluate management objectives after considering climate change impacts. And then the menus I wanted to mention are um, adaptation menus related to Southwest fire. And there's fire information in a tribal menu and also in the California forests menu. And then the last thing I wanted to mention that may be helpful to some people on this call is a literature review by Stevens, Ruman and Morgan in 2019, 
on tree rate generation following wildfires in the Western US. And then um, an annotated bibliography from the Southwest Fire Climb Group. And so hopefully Joel is sharing those links for you so that you can look those up if you're interested. And the last effort that really is about information synthesis is the Southwest Fire Climate Adaptation Partnership. It's a new group that's formed. It's focused on cultural burning. Um, it's also focused on pulling together information about adaptation on the ground. So with that, that's a summary of what we have in terms of some resources available for responding to um, wildfire coming in the future. If you're interested in more information about the Southwest Hub, our quarterly e-bulletin, or our monthly podcast that did, did do an episode on wildfire recently, that information is right here. Thanks. Thanks, Emily, and thanks, Luke. Sorry, I'm a little slow. I'm still trying to post some of the links for Emily into the chat box, but I think I've got them all there if uh, you wanted to go check out any of the resources that Emily just talked about. Uh, I, I think I've got them all posted in there, and if I've missed anything, my apologies. Um, well, actually, I did. There was a second page. Sorry, Emily, it's coming through right now about the link to your podcast um, and other such. Okay, we have uh, left uh, 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 just under 10 minutes left for questions before we round things up. Uh, there were three questions that came in for Luke. If you're still on, Luke, I, I'll direct these next just to you. Um, the, the first one was uh, about the, the soil water repellency, which is fascinating, something I hadn't thought of before. Do we know what causes the repellency? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's um, it's something that can be present in certain types of soils, regardless of whether or not they're they're burned. But it's something that fire often accentuates. Um, in some cases, it's not there, and fire is the thing that causes it. Um, I'm not an, an expert in the specifics of this process, but I, the basic idea is that that I think um, there's water repellent compounds and a lot of organic material, and when the fire moves through. Um, and generates extreme heat, a lot of those uh, water repellent compounds can condense around soil particles and it, it creates this layer near the surface or just under the surface of water repellency. Um, and over time that tends to break down. So it's something that's, that's most severe in the first months to year or so after a fire and then it slowly decays over, over a time period of of, of a couple of years. Great, thanks for explaining that. Uh, Susan asks about the what types of vegetation that returns after a fire? Um, how much of it is native versus invasive species? Yeah, that's, that's a loaded question. Um, and I think it would probably depend a lot from site to site. Um, I'm not, uh, I'll ha I'd have to just kind of punt on this one and say that uh, my expertise is more in um, how fires affect runoff and erosion and, and not so much in um, fire ecology, um, which is, is the, would be the, the study of, of um, you know, in part what comes, what species come back after a fire. But I would imagine that it, that it would have to do a lot or at least somewhat with the conditions after the fire. Um, I mean, I know that in, in southern Arizona, where I am now, um, when we're when when um, our high elevation uh, pine and spruce and fir forests are burning, it's not always those same species that are coming back because um, the climate has changed here and it's not it's not conducive to supporting those same species, um, at least not in all cases. And so um, we're certainly seeing the effects of of what you're talking about, but I'm I'm not sure um, on the specifics of what's driving that. Okay, thanks, Luke. What about any, would anybody else on the call maybe Chuck? Do you have anything to say about um, like the post-fire return of species and what type of species usually come back? I mean, the the one thing I'm aware of is that we tend to get aspen that are replacing pine at higher elevation because they they fill in the canopy faster, and we're tending to get more invasive grasses and weeds in the deserts and lowlands. Aside from that generality, I'm not really sure. It's, it, it's very very site specific and condition specific. Okay, 
Great, we might leave it at that. Thanks to both of you. Uh, another one for Luke from Christopher asks, what is the difference between a shallow landslide and a debris flow and what triggers shallow landslides? Yeah, and so I was a bit wishy-washy on that. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to clarify here. Um, so the type of debris flow that's most common immediately after a wildfire is a debris flow that's generated when runoff rapidly concentrates in steep channels and and very quickly mobilizes a large amount of sediment so that you get something that's like I showed in that picture of this this flowing mass of uh, you know slurry of water and sediment. Um, that's the way that debris flows are often generated immediately after a fire because of these effects like soil water repellency and the complete lack of vegetation that leads to rapid runoff. And then um, several years after a fire, sometimes what we see is the generation of debris flows from shallow landslides, where a shallow landslide occurs not, not generally in a, in a channel, but it will occur on a steep hill slope where water soaks into the soil saturates that soil to such a degree that it becomes unstable and can no longer stay on that steep hill slope and we get a, a rapid failure of some chunk of the hill slope sediment and then as that sediment starts to move downhill it can do what we call mobilize into a debris flow where you get now you get all that water and sediment jumbled up and it starts to actually flow and um, so it's a they're both debris flows um, only they're generated through two very different processes, one from runoff collecting in steep channels and the other from water infiltrating on hill slopes and, and generating that, uh, making the soil unstable. And um, so it's just, uh, they can both be destructive and they're, I would call them both debris flows, but they're just generated through different mechanisms. Ah, fascinating, thanks. For explaining that, it seems like there's some like there's a lot of factors at play there. Um, Jeff posted a link to some research about repellent repellency. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get that moved into the chat box in a minute. Actually, Jeff, would you mind popping that link into the chat box when you get a chance? Um, another question that would come that came through uh, for you, Luke, is. Um, has your work stratis, uh, stratified by vegetation type, like tree-dominated versus shrub-dominated grass? Uh, it seems like this is obvious, but it would drive the recovery time significantly. Yeah, so we we have sites that cover a range of different um, different vegetation types. In Southern California, we're mainly working in chaparral-type uh, ecosystems, um, so shrub-dominated, and then in high elevation areas in New Mexico and Arizona, we're working in in um, ponderosa pine forests often, and then um, we also do some work in southern Arizona, low elevation sites in the Sonoran Desert. And you're absolutely right that that the recovery times are different, and the um, the factors that influence when and where we get debris flows are a little bit different. That um, soils under chaparral, especially after fire, tend to be uh, extremely water repellent. We don't see that same type of water repellency in other environments like the Sonoran Desert. And um, so we, we're still in the process of trying to tease out exactly how these sites are different. We know that they are different, um, but uh, we haven't tracked all of these different factors at enough different sites yet that I could give you a um, that I could make a general statement about how they're different. Um, so I'm I'm sorry about that, but uh, but stay tuned and hopefully I can give you a better answer. And in, in if after a few more years of um, of monitoring these these different areas. Thanks, Luke, um, and thanks to, thanks Emily also for sharing those resources from the USDA. Uh, I'm going to pass back to Amanda to wrap up our webinar today. Great, uh, thanks Joel. I'll be quick here, just a little bit of summary for folks. Um, before I do, I do wanna say first that if drought's impacting you and you'd like to make a condition report, uh, we encourage you to visit Seymour or Seymour Drought from the National Drought Mitigation Center. These reports help the US Drought Monitor, state and local levels hear what's happening on the ground, confirm what we're seeing through our climate data and observations and things like that. So it asks you questions like how many times have you seen drought like this? 
has it been this dry in your part of country uh, recently? How often is it just like this? And also um, a lot of different ways of how drought impacts you, including beyond drought, air quality, dust, pollen, um, people relocating, all kinds of different options. So we just wanna encourage you, if you are seeing drought in your area to uh, shoot us an impact report and that'll help us um, track drought and follow drought throughout the area. Uh, with that, I'll provide closing. Thank you so much to all our great speakers today and all of you guys that have joined us today. There's a lot of information shared and obviously a lot of links in the chat. We'll try to include those all in the post webinar materials and information that we have, which will include a recording on both drought.gov and our YouTube channel, which I shared in the chat um, with a brief summary of each of the different talks. Um, also, don't forget attached is a four page Southwest drought status update. If you'd like some information or maybe like a quick four pager to share with your colleagues and things like that. Um, the next Southwest drought briefing will be held on June in June and in July um, NIDIS is, is working with our partners to figure out how to do another one of these um, larger area webinars um, combining the Southwest Cal California Nevada and the rest of the West for something bigger to provide resources and tools as well as the update and outlook so stay tuned for information on that. Um, also I encourage you to don't forget about drought.gov we got a lot of information there and if you really want information that your localized area you can enter your zip code, you can enter your state, you can enter your region, your drought early warning system, and find more information that's specified to you. Other than that, I'll go ahead and close and say if you have any remaining questions, if there are any we didn't get to, we'll be sure to follow up on email. Feel free to reach out to Joel and I with any questions. And there is a post webinar survey that'll pop up at the end. Um, these surveys help us figure out, make sure we get providing you guys with the best available information. So if you fit, fill out that survey, it helps us figure out what we can share with you guys next time. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and close the webinar and say thank you all so much for attending today and hope you have a good rest of the day.